Welcome to Dimensional Healing. Yah Elohim is our host. She's not here at the moment, but always here. And I am Ma'a, and I am the co-host. And I welcome you to now called Dimensions of Quantum. And we are so sincerely happy to have you here sharing this moment in space and time, the illusionalness of time, measured space, should I call it? We're happy here to share information. Today we're having our loved one, our family that's so much a part of our family, which all of you are. But our guest today is Goth Avaka Harvey. And he's been our longtime family that's coming to share information. And he'll be exploring a new dimension of information. Today is yellow electric sun, blue western crystal of burning, earth's family, polar bear, claim fire. I activate in order to enlighten. Bonding life, I seal the matrix of the universal fire with the electric tone of service. I am guided by the power of flowering. I am a polar kin. I establish the yellow galactic spectrum. Today is Kin 120, Harmonic 30, Electric Matrix Self, Regulating the Universe Fire of Service. That is natural time. To learn more about it, go to Melanin 6. Monique Shabazz is giving lessons on it. And we can learn more of this dream spell that we're in. So wonderful to get the understanding of where we are and what we're in. What's really going on around us? And that's exciting to learn and to grow and to share so much. I'm going to do a recording of one of the ones y'all has recorded previously, How to Access Super Consciousness. That was uh, a tune that you were hearing from... Kenji Kamor, and he took us on a journey, brought us back to center and centering ourselves and attunement and enlightenment. That was lots of fun. So now we can relax. It's the end of the day and enjoy. Oh, I think our guest is here. So I won't play that. We'll go into our guest because. I'm so excited to share and hear all of what God has to tell us. So I'm going to open the line to God, Abaka, Harvey. God, today I would like for you to introduce yourself. It's more fitting. I've said it before you came in, that you are our family, my heart, my love, and a long-time family member. But I want you to introduce yourself and how you would like the people to know you. Well, um, thank you for inviting me again. I, I want to first start by saying that thank you and giving me this opportunity to share, as always, I love to do. Um, I guess I would uh, introduce myself to the family 
as being a universal researcher. I am also a DNA relationship testing specialist, uh, the creator of the myrrh meditation bamboo pyramid, artist, um, holistic health consultant, amongst other things. And most importantly, um, I would like to call add to that uh, list as well, uh, geometrician as well, uh, because of the fascination of, of course, geometric shapes and studying them. And um, pretty much that's what I would like for people to know about myself. You have a question for me? For the people to learn. No, today, uh, Goss and our family, uh, Mm -hmm. Quantum family, Ya isn't here with us at the moment, but she's still here in energy. So she may come in later so that you could be aware of that. So it's me and you in this conversation of sharing. And you can feel your heart out openly. It's your platform. It's your show. Take it. Well, I I appreciate the the opportunity. (laughs) (laughs) Well, well, I'm extremely ecstatic because this – what I'm going to share with the family today is an interesting topic. Um, at least for myself, I haven't really heard much or many people, I should say, actually really dive into this area. So it's a kind of a tricky area. So the first thing I would like to preface before I go into um, this uh, presentation here tonight is I would like for people, regardless of what is said here tonight, what I'm going to say is not to alter your particular box in which we all live in. And each one of us has a specific box that we live in, and we have a set of belief systems that we actually um, subscribe to. And um, this is what we follow. And this is not for that. This is, this is a conversation about in, uh, provoking thought. Uh, this is a conversation at any particular point in time in your your life, as we all do, uh, we go through ups and downs in terms of questioning even our own belief systems. And with this conversation, I am hopeful that in the event that at any point in time in your life you find that your belief system may not particularly work for you, then you can jump into this dimension this conversation is also about dimensions and understanding that we don't necessarily, we don't need to create um, dimensions of extraterrestrial um, existence. We may want to deal with the interterrestrial existence and its dimensionality. Uh, as you've heard me on this program before, I uh, you know speak about. We don't necessarily need to go to the stars to understand dimension. And understanding dimension on the earth plane will allow, in my opinion, would uh, help us tremendously in terms of being able to navigate our life. That's the principle of the pyramids, that I, I, how I build them, as opposed to building pyramids or any other geometric shape based on, you know, just a... Um, uh, idea, or, or not so much idea, but actually a specific, um, uh, uh, I guess, scientific studies that many many have done over hundreds, if not thousands, of years in regards to um, how specific geometric shapes can be uh, utilized within the human dynamic. So I wanted to start by saying that first, so this way. Um, My goal is never to um, uh, offend or upset anyone's specific space or box in which they live in. And um, I just want to be able to, you know, set the stage to provoke a little bit of thought. Um, First, I want to start by tonight's presentation um, is, uh, I titled it, Human Domestications, the Power of Influence. 
And human domestication is a tricky subject because most people walking around today don't think that they're domesticated. On this very program on a few months ago, or I think as recent as last month on the last program, I might have alluded just a tad bit to, uh, you know, uh, some of the geometric shapes and uh, the Great Pyramid being a square and, um, uh, well, aspects of it is based off the the uh, the, uh, the square and squares actually um, is the perfect shape to actually domesticate. And I thought this this platform of domestication would be a a challenging one because most people are not aware that they're domesticated. We actually think that we are, we can roam around here free. And then we're looking at all of these different situations happening in our society today, and we're saying to ourselves, well, here in New York, they're uh, about to, I think, they're considering passing a law, of course, of making individuals pull their pants up. But now we have to look at that. Although I am not a fan of the low pants hanging off one's rear end, but we have to look at that. We have a government institution now dictating what one's uh, personal style should be. And this is an interesting dynamic. This is an aspect of domestication. So tonight I'm going to take us back. We're going to go all the way back. We're not leaving the planet. So I want you, I want everyone to understand that. There will be no talk really about well, we won't leave the planet as we've been told through mythology or, or many of the stories that have been passed down to us about uh, in extraterrestrials from the Pleiades uh, or from Sirius star system. We're not going to necessarily go there. And I also want to say this too: that it's, I'm not I'm not professing that I don't think there's other extraterrestrials or other entities on the planet, or, or any other planet, what I am saying is they're not here. Whatever we say, or whatever we have going on here is an inner earth uh, dynamic, and the intelligences that we attribute to other species uh, is part of a dynamic of manipulation and part of domestication. So, that being said, let's get to it. Domestication. Let us begin. Uh, sorry. sorry. Say it again. No, I was just like, let us begin. I'm excited. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, no, no problem. I just had to drink some water. Mm-hmm. You know, I got to keep the water mm-hmm. right, right there by the side so I can uh, make sure that I, I keep the body moist as I'm going through this actual thing here. As I stated before, it's a difficult topic, and the reason why I got into this topic was back in the 80s. You know, when my mother had taken myself and my siblings, going through uh, uh, going through her changes in her life, she uh, introduced us to Dr. Ben and, and Phil Valentine and many of the great speakers of yesteryear, and I had an opportunity to hear the great Dr. Ben speak about Kemet, her Kemet. And my siblings and myself were so intrigued, we would have conversations of, well, these great civilizations, why are we not being taught this in school? And why we are, why did the, the Egyptians have animal heads and in um, and, and, and human bodies and vice versa? And we always thought that uh, that had to be a form of domestication. And that was our dialogue back in 84, 85 86, when we would, you know, think about these things, and we were so fascinated back then. I was fascinated by the pyramids and just how they built them. So that same fascination from the 80s has never left me. That idea of domestication never left me. And today, I had to go back, and I had to look at what, domestication, what is the domestication and, and who started the domestication? Who was the prime source of domestication on this planet? 
is it truly an alien? Was it a truly an extraterrestrial species that actually started this? Well, I don't think I have the exact answer, but I'm going to propose a, a scenario that maybe can help us figure some things out, and maybe those who are listening here tonight can, uh, uh, you know, if there are researchers, I'm sure there are many of them who listen to uh, Dimensional Healing, we'll probably go ahead and either expound or, you know, uh, we can uh, have a conversation uh, about their theories in terms of how uh, things possibly took place here on this planet. The first thing we must understand, we must go back to what we are privy to in terms of information. Number one is they say 4.5 billion years ago, they say the planet came, oh, well, the solar system, let me say this, the solar system came into existence, that creating the planet. One of the interesting things when I went back and looked at this information was that the Earth in its early stages allegedly did not have an atmosphere. So its influence is said by many scientists who study this kind of thing is that the sun actually, uh, well, the Earth actually didn't have an atmosphere and at some point in time an atmosphere due to all of the chemical reaction, the intelligent chemical reactions that the earth was going through at that specific point in time started to form an atmosphere. Now, keep in mind, the early atmosphere on earth, the first two billion years, there was no oxygen. So we must keep that in the back of our mind. Allegedly, there was no oxygen. So we got to be. I want to be clear on that because oxygen is an integral part of this whole a whole scenario in terms of intelligence. So now, fast forward. Now, the Earth is a thinking entity, creating constantly, creating, creating multiple algorithms in order to find ways to express itself, as each planet does. Each, anything in the cosmos, whether we can see it or not, is actually expressing itself. So Earth expressing itself, going along quite easily. 2.5, 2, 2 million, 2 billion, excuse me, 2 billion years ago. It, well, over 2 billion, but in the first 2 billion years of its physical construct, it's creating an atmosphere. This atmosphere was quite different than what we know it today without oxygen. They state that uh, there were rock formations, there were water, but all of, this, all of these uh, kinds of things were totally different than how we know it today. There were also, at, certain, at a certain point in time in Earth's history, there were plants, the development of a specific species of plant. This specific species of plant in which I speak of is known as a gymnosperm. A gymnosperm is what they, it's called a, a naked seed. That's what the meaning of a gymnosperm is. And this gymnosperm was flourishing. It was flourishing, but it didn't, which surprised me, because when I went back, I would think that fruits and vegetables probably would have exist, existed during that period of time, but to my chagrin, it wasn't. It, 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 it didn't exist during that time. And I was like, that, that's very interesting. So during this formation, as, as the earth is chuggling along, we get, we get uh, different types of species. Now, all of this is being done by microbes, intelligent life forms that are creating this nice little existence for us, as we, as we now call it. Um, these microbes, intelligent, and I want, I'm, the reason why I'm harping on the intelligence because I want people to understand that it is the small things that we don't see that are intelligent. These microbes also, which formed at some point a specific kinds of bacteria, these bacteria then formed another kind of bacteria. They're all doing business until they reach a point of a bacteria or what they call a chloroplast, which is a cell, 
that actually takes light, transform it through a chemical process, which we now know as photosynthesis, taking using carbon dioxide and water in order to create oxygen. Now, see, after the first two billion years and the the uh, formation of this uh, actual um, specific kind of chloroplast, which we now call, or which is also known as, I should say, as blue-green algae. And blue-green algae now, uh, which was found at the bottom of the ocean, then actually started to, um, at some point in time, emit oxygen into the atmosphere along with uh, volcanic eruptions, some scientists argue back and forth on how this process is going. What I'm trying to lay down here is in, is a path of intelligence, you know, through the microscopic world as it starts to develop and create all sorts of different things. We get to about 2.5 billion years ago now, this insertion of oxygen into the planet, we're saying to our, one must say to themselves, different types of life forms, and it did, because as I stated just a moment ago, the gymnosperm was was flourishing, and how, how did they, with no bees or anything like that in particular, to pollinate or do anything like that, how did they, how were they able to spread? Well, the winds were able to blow the pollen across uh, specific lands, and that's how these uh, plants were able to flourish, and they were doing their thing, and then of course, as the planet develops because the planet is always maturing and the planet is always being influenced because as long as you have a light source, you will always have mutation. So the planet constantly is mutating and creating different algorithms. This algorithm now coming into about 2.5 billion years, we get uh, a, an aspect of the gymnosperm starting there, which is called the gametophyte. If I'm not mistaken, this particular species of gymnosperm birthed a new species of plant known as the angiosperm. This happened with the increased oxygen levels here on this planet. Then, once that happened, we started to see animals started to be created. Not aliens, animals being created, not aliens coming here from another, in my opinion, if you let me tell the story, is not an alien from another star system, it's intelligent life here. The key factor is oxygen. Now, one of the interesting things about oxygen is this. Oxygen, then, when it first started to rise... It wasn't the dominant force. It was carbon dioxide. So the plants, of course, as we understand how this whole thing works between humans, we breathe in oxygen and then we give out oxygen. We give out, we breathe, we breathe in oxygen and then spew out uh, carbon dioxide, which is love. This is the, the aspect of love. I give you, you give me. That is love. You know what I mean? So we can have a mutually beneficial relationship. That's what the, I guess, the negotiation was between the human organism and the plant initially. We'll create you, you do this, you do this kind of work, but boom, this is, this is how it's going to roll. But let me go back. So now carbon dioxide being one of the more prominent substances in the environment at that, at that specific point in time, is now starting to lessen with the rise of oxygen. Oxygen rises, we start flourishing. Things start flourishing. Animals really started to shoot up because oxygen went up to 35%. It was 35% of Earth's atmosphere. That's what shot but up. God, excuse me, but now how did yeah. the animal begin to shoot up, was the word you used, but begin to develop? What? Well, that's the key, oxygen. The oxygen somehow, and this is what's unclear with science, um, the higher levels of oxygen 
apparently based through uh based on I guess maybe their their actual biological construct actually got them to uh grow taller. But and, what made uh, them develop in the first place? The oxygen. Just the so just they, the, the, was, just the was, oxygen this this animal whatever animal it may be yes developed it 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 just appeared it appeared on earth it just didn't appear on earth it appeared on earth over time based on algorithms so for instance it's almost like let's look at it this way if an individual you're trying to start a business and you're trying to be successful in the business you're going to go through a number of obstacles in order to find the right thing that gets your business flourishing. So you're going to try this this kind of marketing. Oh, that didn't work. This time I market to these kind of people. That didn't work. Until you find the right environment of people to market to, then you say, ah, I got it. This is what, this is what the uh, micro – organism world does. These little microorganisms, oh, they're constantly okay. calculating. Mm. Right. And based on environment, mm. they created, based on the environment, they created specific scenarios and, seeing, and, and, and see how it would play out for each scenario depending on its environment. And that's what it did. If this didn't work, then they, out, they, they, they were masters of alchemy. So if that didn't work, then okay, we're gonna make the next. We're gonna we're gonna change this algorithm here in order to create a different species. So if we take our modern day sensibility as uh, and apply it to what is done, because that's where we birthed it from. Our idea, of, even of our idea of marriage, um, the idea, the stories of hermaphrodite, hermaphroditism, um, all of these things that come from the the micro world. This is what it is. You know what I mean? So everything is algorithm. That's why we, we we look at the mathematics and we think about that. We we don't need to really look to anything outside of what has taken place because again, we are we are uh, we are a part of this planet and it's based on algorithm. So so how but, become but based the, on the it progression. But it wasn't like they thought and said, Okay, we're gonna try this and we're gonna try that. It well, I was guess that, that, that's a tricky question to answer. Because, about it, but I, I, okay, what did you say? No, you know how my head thinks because it's like no, okay, please, they please, weren't I love it. thinking. Uh, they weren't thinking because we're we're all thinking and we think that this is the way it happened. It wasn't a thought that that came I, way later. As a far as thought, it was development because the planet continues to evolve, and it's not a thought of it evolving and forever changing. So as it develops, it develops, and then it developed, and then it developed, and then, then there's this animal, correct? Well, I, I, couldn't, I wouldn't say that it didn't have some kind of conscious thought. Um, it, it wanted to create something, and then based on what you create, it's like, if you create this massive empire, you have to look at the environment around you and see how you're going to either adapt, and if you don't adapt, then you will phase yourself out and be recycled, and then something else comes in new into your place. So I think there is, a, there is an element of conscious thought because, again, the way I look at the actual biology of life is everything is they're thinking, but they and they have an idea of what they want to do, but do they know every outcome? No. So which they, I'm I'm sure aspects of aspects of um, nature uh, uh, put things in place in in order to uh, be able to dictate, actually domesticate, and, and the reason why I would say that the, the plant is an, an intelligent thinker is because if we look at, if we look at um, plants today and looking at, no, well, let me, let, before I even go there, let me, let me say this. If we look at the angiosperm species, when that came about about 2.5 billion years ago, right, the first, as far as we know, 
going back. Um, there were no pollinators, so keep in mind, there were no insects doing any kind of pollinating at that particular point in time. They didn't exist until it matured and they started to create fruit. That was only during the inception of oxygen. And as oxygen rise, then fruits became prominent. During that time, um, fossil evidence has shown that the wasp and the bee were actually mixed fused together, more bee than wasp. At some specific point in time, the plants, this is, this is thinking here, um, the plants was able to seduce the wasp into doing its bidding by offering it fragrance, giving off a fragrance, something sweet to attract it. So that means that they had to understand that chemistry. You get what I'm saying? So you're seeing the intelligence mm -hmm. of the plant being able to manipulate an actual insect in order to help it spread its message like uh, uh, like a, a religious institution would spread its message all over the place. The same thing with a pollinator when you get a bee to cooperate in that specific fashion. This process also took place, too, during a species of gymnosperm. Before we got to the angiosperms, it also got to, to a process of gymnosperm known as, um, uh, they call them conifers, and, and the conifer species also embodies um, the, the pine tree and how they were able to also, uh, at a, a point in time in history, manipulate because the first pollinators, uh, probably unbeknownst to most people, we would think it was the bee, but actually it's the beetle. The beetle was actually the first one, and somehow that specific plant was able to uh, negotiate with the beetle at some point. But one of the things I think we get confused with when we look at, like, the micro world is that we think, okay, this one microorganism is actually, uh, would, uh, is actually in control of everything. But what we have is families and people just spreading out all over, just like if we look at each organ in our body. Each, if we looked at each organ in our body, the, the, uh, if we looked at the kidney and the liver, they both have different uh, cycles of regeneration of their cells, like the liver mm -hmm. moves. You, you see that? So if you take that principle. Exactly. And it, and it and takes the, oxygen. The disease begins because of lack of oxygen. There you go. There you mm -hmm. go. The lack of oxygen. Is the, mm -hmm. So the intelligence and the spirituality of the human organism is oxygen. But since this conversation is about domestication, I wanted to start out by really show uh, at okay. least sharing a little bit of uh, of mm -hmm. of uh, the the planet's intelligence in terms of how it's able to negotiate. Which I'm still going to stay in that 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 space. But it's about domestication, and one of the things that people may not may or may not be aware of is that how did the human organism. Now, see, I mentioned all of these plants and stuff like that, but we need to know who domesticated the plants. Who set down the framework for the animals and the, and the, the animal world and the human animal? Who set that down? Who, who laid the foundation for them? What organism did that? Would you like to take a shot at this, Ma'a, or I can go right in and tell you? No, go right ahead. You got it. Okay, not a problem. The worm. Oh, wow. The worm is the most intelligent alchemist on the planet. The worm. And I know some of you probably say, okay, maybe maybe that might be a stretch. But feel me on this here. I, I would like the family to to really feel me on this here. You've heard me talk about the Nagas a whole bunch, and on your program I, we mm -hmm. spoke to the Nagas, and I went to Cambodia and saw the mm -hmm. Naga serpents and everything like that. Doing this research, I said, what does the etymology of worm mean? The worm actually means 
serpent dragon. Who knew that the worm was known as the serpent or the dragon? So I started saying to myself, wait a second. Not only is the worm known as the serpent or the dragon, maggots and scorpions also used to be called worm. I said, wow, that's really fascinating. Scorpions? Scorpions Scorpions were known as the worm. Please do not overestimate the scorpion. The scorpion is highly intelligent, and we've learned a whole lot. See, We've been told many alien species come here to this earth, but I would ask everyone listening here tonight, pay attention to every alien movie, or a good majority of them, and look at the alien species. Keep in mind, the alien species in which they show you from other other galactic realms mostly look like some kind of over-exaggerated insect. I think mm-hmm. there's something there. that's true. <laughs> yeah, you see, see mm-hmm. what I'm trying to set up here is for people to understand the, when we're dealing with dimensions, if you're going to travel anywhere, you need a point of reference. This is why, in my opinion, how does one know without oxygen that most of these uh, planets and organizations, or, 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 I mean, or, or, or Uh, planets and structures don't embody oxygen, which is the animating force, which is the spirituality that is needed, at least for a species that look like us. Otherwise, the species on these other planets, would they would look probably marginally different and they would move differently. But yet still, they're showing us on TV what, um, what these species look like. They look like insects, you know what I mean, or some kind of deformed, uh, insects of sorts, and you just distort it. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's called what the ancient Egyptians called the, uh, being able to um, uh, utilize uh, rhetoric, but visual, I call it visual rhetoric, you know what I mean, um, and, and music, because music sets the theme for a lot of movies, and that's what creates the ambiance. So that kind of uh, overstanding was actually transferred from thousands of years in being able to manipulate um, specific scenarios today. So this is is an an ancient craft that uh, people have done for thousands upon thousands of years, and we've just, because of um, environmental scenarios, we have been utilized, in my opinion, to uh, bring forth specific technologies for whatever the bigger goal is, maybe to domesticate other planets, to understand as much as possible to do that, I'm not exactly sure. But what, I, what I'm very, I'm leaning more towards is that everything that we thought that existed in terms of aliens domesticating us based on stories from ancient people um, uh, that we've interpreted from ancient people as being extraterrestrial uh, I don't necessarily subscribe to that anymore. But that being said, um, as I digress back to the worm and it's uh, it, it, it being the domesticator of everything, put it this way, and anyone who has a scientific background or who has studied worms or who's a farmer will tell you, if you don't have worms grazing your land, You won't have vegetation, period, end of story. That's how this thing actually took place. When the worm was created, it started its campaign on domesticating a specific way and the plants having an opportunity to flourish, vegetation having an opportunity to flourish. Another thing that we need to understand and many of many people who are into the Commission history, Cleopatra. Cleopatra actually laid out a decree across Egypt stating that no one, no one, no one is to touch a worm 
No one is to take a worm and interfere with it on the land because she, as well as all of Kenneth, knew that the worm was the key because it had vegetation, specific kinds of vegetation. Of course, the angiosperm, which is going crazy, which is still one of the, which is the predominant species of plant growing when you're looking at all of these uh, different types of uh, fruits and things during that period of time. So we're looking at half of the Earth's existence. These angiosperms started making a rise. One interesting thing I can tell you this is, and this is what we need to keep in mind. I want people, this is, uh, uh, I'm, bolding, I'm bolding this aspect of this uh, conversation. Oxygen. When it shot up, it shot up to 35%, flourished a lot of the dinosaurs. They started becoming taller. They even found a dragonfly that was two and a half feet long. Then something happened, environment change, drops down to, uh, to 15%, oxygen. Oxygen dropped to 15%. Guess what happened? Dinosaurs. Mass extinction. It just stopped the program. But now what happened? It, what, what dropped? The oxygen. Oxygen dropped. And oxygen dropped and mass extinction took place on the planet. That, that's mm. what science is saying killed off. If this is true. This, if this but what is true, caused the oxygen to drop? They are uncertain. They are uncertain. But, again, the planet is overwhelmingly intelligent. This is something that man has been trying to keep up with nature. Right now we're in the process of attempting to, uh, to control nature in such a fashion to move the, the next evolution of our species forward. So that is a, 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 a huge key point because, see, now what I'm – what I'm hopeful of, that I'm successful in doing is kind of showing the importance of oxygen to our own existence and in terms of our kind of our animating movements and the vegetation in which we eat. So it was, it's almost like uh, these organisms created this uh, earthbound oasis understanding that we're going to create this species of angiosperm and then we're just going to cr kind of set up different scenarios all over the place, like set up different cities and we've got so many different cultures and whatnot. It's a very mm -hmm. fascinating dynamic, so much so that we even utilized, it's within ancient history when we speak about certain elements of nature, like the worm, uh, we talked that we, we were misled or maybe misinterpreted many of the, the, uh, the text when they were saying the serpent. So now throughout the ancient world, everyone is looking at the snake. So I had to analyze that. I said, let me look at the snake, which is known as a serpent or the cobra known as a serpent, and then let me look at this worm, the only way I can determine where they were going, or what I, uh, I'm, uh, of course, uh, making prob maybe a, a bit of an assumption here, but the snake's function is as carnivore. And carnivores are very important because they're here to maintain balance. You can't have one species just going all, all overboard. You've got to slow that down. The worm's function is highly intellectual. Do you know what the, the worm does, my aunt? It maintains acid and pH levels in the soil. That's huge. Mm -hmm. Intelligent, mm -hmm. very balanced. That means that you're trying to keep a perfectly functioning body. The planet Earth, the soil, you're trying to do that without the worm. You know, we've, we've tried to make all of these uh, different things, certain kinds of fertilizers to do the job of the worm, but nothing is more effective than that worm. Another thing that we need to 
to, to I, I want to point everybody's attention to, and I, I need to thank my brother because as I was expressing some of these ideas to him, he actually helped lead me in this specific direction. The worms, the worms, Latin name is called lumbra sedae, lumbra sedae, L-U-M-B-R-I-D-A-E, lumbra sedae. What does the human organism have that we call in our body that's similar to that name, lumbra, lumbra sedae, the lumbar? Our lower Mm -hmm. spine, lumbre, lumbar, our spine. Very important for us to understand the correlation. So it's not so much the Naga snake serpent, which we have come to overstand. It is the, the Naga serpent worm, the most intelligent, balanced creator on the planet, and domesticator. So if we are going to look at who has domesticated us for billions of years, well, billions of years, then we're talking about the worm getting in its, its instructions from microbes, understanding because it engulfs everything. And how the, what the worm does, it takes, it takes everything. It needs everything. Its digestive system is is an alchemical mass that takes it and then regurgitates it back out, and it flourishes the soil. It, it also has your good friend that you get rid of all the time too, mucus as well too, and it uses that mucus, that slimy mucus. That's why you can't, when you try to grab it, you, it's a hard time. To, it's kind of difficult to grab the worms because they're slimy. That's mucus. Mm-hmm. So they use that to to burrow into the ground. It's a fascinating dynamic when we look at this world here. But I'm pointing these things out because once we, you start looking at specific things a specific way, we start to understand a different storyline here. You're seeing infinite intelligence, a worm balancing your the, the, the population, and it's done it for, for half of the planet's uh, existence. Mm. You wouldn't have existence. On any place, it's clear. Science will tell you, if there was no worms, you will have no life. That's why it was important. This is probably why all of ancient civilizations went ahead and and and, and got next to the water. You know what I mean? Because uh, when you talk about some of the older species going back during that time, you're you're talking about worm species. They found a phallic head species that, that uh, the oldest one that they found was something like uh, close to, uh, what was it, uh, I think it was anybody, 200 and five, between 250 to 500 million years. That's insane. The intelligence of the worm. The worm is your naga. The worm, that kundalini mm-hmm. energy that we talk about, in mm-hmm. the base of our spine, is the infinite intelligence of the worm being able to to, to rise to the occasion, getting that information from the source, which is our planet, which is trying to express itself. This is what's going on here, in my opinion, the expression of a planet. And that's not to say that the planet didn't make mistakes. It, oh, you have to make a mistake. See, these kinds of uh, uh, things that we go through, like they say, hey, uh, you know when people work out, they say uh, no pain, no gain. You have to have that struggle and whatnot. Well, these kinds of ideas and sensibilities are not new. They're very old. We, just because we are not in the dimension of an insect doesn't mean that those things don't exist. You know what I mean? Or those, some of those sensibilities don't exist because we're a culmination of all of that. That's why when we look at the brain, we say, oh, we have the reptile brain. The, the hind brain is considered the reptile brain, the oldest part of the brain. You know what I mean? And when we think about reptiles, they say reptiles used to fly. They had wings at one point in time. And then something happened that changed the dynamic that, you know, you get birds that do its thing. Now we have uh, the crawling reptiles when at one point in time that species used to be one and the same 118, 125 million years ago. 
allegedly. So when we're looking at all of these things, what, what I'm hopeful that people can appreciate is the infinite intelligence, how something can be created just by, you know, creating different, based on environment, number one, and what the earth changes are going through to see what's going to happen. And guess what? Today we do the same thing. We put people in cities. People are in all of these cities, and you see how they're going to respond. And guess what? When you put somebody in the city and you're able to see what they're going to respond, then you know exactly what to do. And what do you do? You emulate nature. I'm going to feed you. Infinite intelligence of the worm. I'm going to feed you and give you instruction. That's, isn't that what's happening today? No different. Mm-hmm. Genetic modified yes, food. Indeed. I'm going to feed you eating for instruction. I'm going to keep you feeding for instruction so it's easy for me to get you to move in the direction that is needed. This is a, ever go, a, a story that's been going on for billions of years on this planet. Even when we look at uh, some of the, the early organisms like prokaryotes, before prokary- prokaryotes were first, and then you, 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 eukaryotes uh, came into play, which is said that that's where our DNA comes from that, but it's the agreement between the prokaryote and the eukaryote uh, to actually uh, do business. You know what I mean? That's what this is about. Mm-hmm. Doing business. This whole thing is a business deal. That's all it is. Business transaction. If you understand and you're good at business and negotiating, this is all it is because now you have one organism that that took on uh, uh, another organism. How, uh, uh, the, how these uh, scientists theorize it is that one organism took, a, uh, took on another organism but they didn't have a digestive system. But that other, that set, the smaller organism was engulfed by the larger organism, but that smaller organism was able to process light. That's the chloroplast. And mm-hmm. at some point in time, they created an agreement that kind of got this thing moving the way it is. So the universe seems, based on the information that, is, that, that we are aware of at this particular point in time, to be like somebody's, always doing business with somebody else, and then there's an agreement. So that brings a whole new light to what you are, what you eat, when you uh, really think about it. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, in in the Gospel of Thomas, and this is an interesting dynamic that uh, I would like people to really actually wrap their mind around. Jesus allegedly said that, Gospel of Thomas, that if a lion eats a human, then the lion becomes human. If the if the human eats a lion, the lion still becomes human. That sounds like class for me. The further you get away from source, the lower down the line you you become because it what I interpret that as that the human is the lowest one on the train in terms of uh intelligence. And it's quite interesting that the human organism today, as we know it today, can it cannot tell when a storm is coming based on its senses, can't do that. We have no we, we can't do that. But animals can tell you. The scorpion most people are not even may not even be aware that the scorpion utilizes the star system to navigate at night, and then when the sun comes up, it it, it utilizes a protective shield over its many eyes in order for them to not be radiated or become mutated. This is how the the, the scorpion was able to bring it down millions and millions of years. Well, part of that too, they, they understand what scorpions and spiders and uh, the, the arachnid group was able to do, how they were able to, to see that going back uh, uh, millions and millions of years is through amber seeping onto them, and amber carried the actual uh, species forward, some of the ancient species, so that's how they're able to determine that. But mm. right now, we, 
yeah, yeah, this is really a fascinating look at how domestication works back then, bringing it forward now, because I think we've taken it for granted based on how we were educated, but that's by design. Now, some some may say, well, how did these ancient ancestors got their intelligence? Well, keep in mind, those who have wisdom in every social group, every social group. Now, keep in mind, there are not many social groups. Now, a social group, when we're talking about a species, you could look to great social groups, the bee, the ant, groups of termites. They have very excellent social groups, and there's things about a social group that uh, uh, that works together in a cohesive fashion. Number one, they would need to, of course, care for their young. You know what I mean? They stay there. They, well, as a collective, you know, that's based on some of the African, uh, when we go back in the time, some of the African groups uh, actually had that uh, you, you take care. It was a communal thing that the community raised the children. That would be a social uh, or an aspect of a social group, you know what I mean? Being a working together, I guess, for a common cause. Uh, another aspect for a social group like the B, they understand what it is, and they're normally in many of these social groups, there is a hierarchical hierarchy system. If you take the ant, the ant is extremely fascinating. Let me show you the infinite intelligence of an ant. The infinite intelligence of the ant, although they, we call it a, a queen bee, but the queen bee doesn't actually give out instructions, so to speak, at least as far as we, we can tell, science has been able to identify. What the, what the, the queen ant does, of course, it, it gives off a pheromone so everyone knows that, you know, she's, she's so uh, strong and, and empowered because she's given birth to the community. But what's interesting is they have, uh, depending on the species, they have uh, classes of three or four. And what happens is the smallest of the small actually take care of the larvae and do all of that. And they're responsible for feeding the larvae. So the small ants feed. Based on how much they feed a larvae will be based on their function within their social class in terms of what they do. Those are the second-tier domesticators as well, too. They're part of the domestication process when you deal with ants and also the bees. So the bees and the ants play a huge role, in particular that bee, because they're involved with all types of, uh, 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 of fruits, nuts, uh, you know, okra, tomatoes. There's so many things that the bee is in, involved in that we've, we've, we've just associated them with honey. You know what I mean? The honey being I'm talking about. But they are a tremendous pollinator, along with butterflies, beetles, and a, a plethora of others. But the key one that you see on just about every fruit, honeybee. This is why the Egyptians modeled their civilization, in my opinion, based off of the bee. And if you look at ancient mm. Chinese, right, they modeled them off of the bee. America, in my opinion, is currently modeled off of the bee. But with this world, uh, one world idea, they're following China, which is modeled off of the ant. They're modeling everything is done by the gods. The gods are those who understand domestication. The greatest domestication, domesticators, you have to go nowhere. This is why, in my opinion, when we look at all of these ancient monuments, in these ancient sites, and you see people with wings and all of that, those are interpretations of insects, man and insect. And for those who may think that may be a stress, I want you to chomp on this. And this bit of information, I have to thank uh, Reverend Valentine. And um, Reverend Valentine did a lecture some years ago opening for uh, another great lecturer, um, Dr. Delbert Blair. He spoke about 
And he said something very profound, because I could imagine that when the people that first heard him say this, when he talked about what is the most ideal color to process sunlight. And he ended up telling them the color green. And he ended up, he also said in that specific lecture that green would be the ideal color for what we, what is known as the man plant, that people were once green. Now, I, could, I, I was not there in attendance, but I can only imagine what some people might have thought when he said that. But hold your horses for those who may think that that might be a bit far-fetched. Because as he said in that same lecture, he stated the the man plant was known as Sataparna, S-A-P-T-A-P-A-R-N-A, Sataparna, the Buddhist. For those who who do research, could look on the Buddhist text or the Vedic text, uh, I should say, the Vedic Hindu text, you will find the story of Saptopana, the man plant, said to be sevenfold, sevenfold man plant. In my opinion, they're talking about the seven rays of light, the uh, visible spectrum. This is what they're talking about when you're talking about sevenfold energy. This is what, in my opinion, they are referring to within their doctrine for the man plant being able to go through a similar process of photosynthesis, being able to take energy from the sun and make it into chemical energy to get, uh, to get things moving and get things done. But then, after after actually revisiting Reverend Valentine's work, because, see, I didn't think about that until I found this. I looked at the word as I was going through human evolution and going from Orphalopithecus straight down to Homo sapiens sapiens. And I said, let me break down what Homo sapiens is and what's the difference you know, pretty much between Homo sapien and Homo sapien sapien. There is Homo sapien sapien is modern human, and then we have Homo sapien. So let's look at the let's look at Homo sapien. Homo meaning the same. That's what it means. The same man. And that's what they attribute it to when you look that stuff up. Sapien. What's said in most places? The wise, intelligent. So Homo sapien would be the the, the same group, which is, which is what Homo is. The same group, which is the wise and the uh, wise, you know, the wise wise. So well, for Homo sapien, it would be the wise, and then the the wise or the wise or the wiser, or something to that effect. When you double up on the word sapien, but that wasn't satisfying enough. So I broke the word down. Okay, what does it say? Sapien. S a p i e n. Sap. Sap is what's found in plants. So therefore, sap is fluid in a plant. Eon is relating, related to. So that's what eon means, related to something. Related to fluid of a plant. The same. So you got the same in homo related to fluid in the plant. You tell me if that is not a slap in our face telling us exactly what it is. Homo sapien. Then you have, if we're going to talk about cloning, Homo sapien sapien. What I am proposing for people to think about, not saying that this actually happened, because for all I know, I could be wrong. Maybe people did come from outer space and do all of this. But what I am saying is that the infinite intelligence is here to do it on its own and utilize organisms to do its bidding. 
the same way the 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 so the the, the so intelligent plants manipulated the bee and actually got it to separate into two different organisms, a wasp and a bee. Over a period of time, this didn't happen like that. Sometimes we think that it takes time for these things to happen. So, what I'm proposing at this particular point in time, that if we're going to look at an infinite intelligent species, we might want to look at one of the Homo species or Homo under Homo sapien. Now, this is clear. Now, Homo sapien may not have cloned Homo sapien sapien. We need to go a little further back under the Homo sapien umbrella because there are different kinds of Homo sapien, like uh, which is under the umbrella of Homo sapien, like Denisova, which most people are not familiar with. That name is starting to gain ground, which has some of human, Neanderthal, and, uh, 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 and its own DNA, which is said to be allegedly uh, some, there are some, people on this planet, groups of people on this planet, like those who are located in Australia, who have uh, some of this Denisova DNA in Australia, some of the the uh, so-called aborigines. Then we look at, we can look at um, uh, Homo Hindenburgus. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but um, this one goes back about 800,000 years. So what I did was, since he's the oldest one that they're considering the class of Homo sapien, and uh, they brought it on forward, I looked at many of the uh, the time spans which they said that the, the specific aspects of Homo sapien sapien actually existed. And what I found out, looking at the years, if the years are accurate and true, that each one of these species actually overlap into the other one. Fascinating. What would do that? Well, 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 why would it do that? Well, just like anything else, you're always going to have some of the old and the new, and those who could not make the adaptation, they get wiped off. But if you have infinite intelligence, you know, the closer you are to to source, the more you recognize things, the more that you can actually have some influence. Because anytime something is created, it'll have influence based on also your environment and what you consume. So if the vegetarian eaters, which were consuming, because they were the ones actually dictating the terms at, at, a, at that specific point in time in history, because they started, they 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 were actually able to manipulate and get the, the insects to actually do their bidding by spreading their, their seeds further out. And they're growing all over the place, along with the worms and everything like that. So we have to pay huge respect to the actual angiosperm and their ability to actually uh, utilize insects to domesticate. And then because we were using the plants, the people also got domesticated as due to circumstance, you know what I mean? And this is how certain things happen. So for me, if people are looking at, well, how did, how did we get uh, 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 gorillas, apes, and all, all of these different things, I, I would say that these different species came about because of environmental conditions that created a specific climate for these kinds of species to flourish and actually develop over a period of time. And then when climates change, as everything does, as I alluded to earlier, the spike in oxygen, if it's true, allegedly wiped out in the whole dinosaur age because they couldn't deal with that, that, that uh, just about, uh, uh, you know, what is it, uh, a 35, uh, 20% drop in uh, actual oxygen. And then right now we're at currently at 21%. So it's important for us, again, to really pay attention to the rhythm and the algorithm of how things are actually happening within nature because, again, we're only, in my opinion, mimicking what nature is doing. So the plants, through those who have utilized the plant ayahuasca and some people who have utilized other things that um, uh, that uh, send you in the, to these transient states, 
can get you. People have claimed to have seen different entities in different dimensions when you engage with certain kinds of plants. And then they come back and they say, oh, well, I was able to create and do all of these other things. So why can't that same sensibility be used for those who were doing that many moons ago, who probably had a better understanding of chemistry, of course, than we do today? You know what I mean? And this is where the idea for the shamans and all of these people being uh, the the uh, the keepers of information. There's always one when you're trying to set up a uh, a social society. And keep in mind, uh, the human organism is not really social. We only have spots of social. I also want people to think about this too. Families, although we say that's my family, but most families, at least let me not push my sensibilities or my perspectives on everyone else. I will say this. In my experience on this planet, I cannot recall too many families that moved in the same direction. Everybody is moving in another direction, and they're doing and they're trying to express him or herself. A family, like a corporation normally run by families, have a specific interest. What are they mimicking? Nature. Bees have a specific interest. Nature, to domesticate. Families, corporations, businesses, here to domesticate. This is what it is. The more organized the family, the more focused the family, the more you will be able to leave your imprint on this planet. This is how you do business. This is the recipe for success. Have a family with a focused goal. You now have a successful foundation or the start of a successful foundation where you and your family could now lead uh, have influence and have say. Not that you couldn't do it on an individual level, but you can do it in spurts and then that family dies out. And not to say that your influence couldn't influence someone from another family, because that is also true. They does not necessarily be from your same family, but you can also have influence, which many people have done. You, we see people still... Uh, trying to do, uh, trying to rebuild the ancestors' uh, work in terms of um, the pyramids. You know what I mean. But let me bring it forward a little bit. You know what I mean in terms of domestication, because I'm going to try to touch as many many areas. Because there's a lot of information, so I'm like kind of jumping around so I can get people. Uh, you know, the the kind of the three aspects of uh, you know creation, some of the antiquity stuff, you know what I mean, and now I'm moving forward. Another thing that we must understand in, ter in terms of our current domestication, how did they do it? How were they able to do it? Well, number one, I, I think I, and I'm hopeful that I've established a little bit that infinite intelligence, if you take specific plants and you understand the plant, that's why it's important to understand the plant or verstand a stone, or verstand some crystal, or anything else. When you, when in terms of uh, its personality and the energy that it actually it, it resides within that specific uh, substance or entity. Well, all things are entities, and they want to express their. Or they want to express themselves. So if an energy or an entity wants to express themselves, who's to say that the human organism, at least our current version, modern day, which has been perceived by those from yesteryear as being the lowest in terms of, uh, 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 of most likely universal intelligence, we're still trying to find our way within our box. And keep in mind, I'm putting the emphasis in our box because I think this is a good time for me to say that I am of the mindset. And I could be wrong, but I'm of the mindset that 
this domestication, this wherever you're located in whatever city, are our prisons. And I look at every city throughout the world as being quarantine centers, and I am of the mindset that we're being utilized for um, as a, like almost like a, a, a lab rat, so to speak, in order to get things done for a species that keeps themselves not so much in the sunlight because they recognize that the sun um, actually mutates. Now, this brings us into a different uh, a, a, a different uh, place a little bit here because what a lot of people don't recognize is that the sun, if this is true, again, I'm not speaking with any stone facts because I only can go based on what is what we have here that's available to us as my point of reference. So therefore, I wasn't there, at least in the current form that I am in now, wasn't there back then. But what I would say, if it's true, what some scientists are now theorizing is that Saturn used to be the light source for planet Earth. Very interesting concept. Now, they're saying this probably took place about 10,000 years ago. No one really knows for sure, but they're going based on what the ancestors back in uh, Mesopotamia, Acadia, Sumeria, and a lot of uh, 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 of the pictographs and things that are taking place, and they're looking at these uh, the rock art images, and they're, what they're noticing is that a lot of these rock art images are plasma emissions emitted, emitted in the skies, and that was taken from the skies and put, in, put on walls, so... People might have, and today are interpreting, oh, that must be an alien, or that must be something else. But what they're saying is that they're able to recreate these plasma emissions that they, that they potentially saw in the sky, and what they did was put them on the walls. Now, how does Saturn come into this, this equation? Um, and they're basing this based on ancient texts because what we call the sun was also the name for Saturn. They called Saturn Helios. They also um, call Saturn soul. These are all the same kinds of terminology used for now our current sun. Now, if Saturn did, okay, if Saturn did uh, or was, I should say, our main light source at, at one point in time given us light, that means that the ambiance here would be totally different on this planet, meaning it would be a different light source, which would also explain the existence partially of that specific kind of, uh, 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 of chloroplast being able to process light before the actual birth of the New Age angios, angiosperm that actually came later. Now, I know science is saying 10,000 years ago, but I think that that specific event that was brought forward actually happened millions of years ago, and I would say that would be probably part of the process uh, of the sun when the sun came into uh, into being the main light source for planet Earth. That would have taken place when Jupiter uh, uh, came in and knocked Saturn into its current, uh, its current position. And the reason why I say that is because the Earth never had oxygen. You know what I mean? This is just a theory. I'm looking more towards that period of time when oxygen started to become abundant. It didn't have oxygen, and it started to process oxygen. And I think that came with the influence of the sun, which does have oxygen. You know what I mean? And the level of consciousness of the sun is one of the high ones, although the sun is more dense than even Saturn. Saturn, in my opinion, based on its composition, see the composition of the planet or any organism out there will tell you the level of, of its consciousness. The more dense you are, the more material you become, you move away from the universal or the cosmic consciousness, in my opinion. 
That's the way, when I look at these things, this is what I'm looking at and this is what I'm basing it on, based on the composition that we are currently aware of. So when I look at this scenario that is taking place on this planet, I'm saying to me, to myself, that if Saturn did have influence, the light source, which goes to answering your question in, in terms of what possibly took place that happened, the sun happened. The sun that we now call the sun happened. But we probably would have been different under the auspice of Saturn because Saturn is, has a different kind of consciousness. You know what I mean? And they're further away from being dense than the actual sun based on construct. You get what I'm saying? So the consciousness of the individual, we can take these same, con the, these same concepts that I'm utilizing and we can use them today in modern times so people can understand. You could take a person. You could take what we would deem in any society the, a good person, a person that follows the rules, and you take them and you put them amongst a, a group of people that don't follow the rules, they don't get along, and see how that environment influences them. That person will be influenced in some way, shape, form, or fashion in order for that person's survival. This is what would happen. So I think what's happening here on this planet and the reason why gymnosperms and angiosperms, which I, I can easily see competition because that's what it is, you're going to keep trying to survive and you keep trying to express yourself, this planet now has a war. We are, it, it's always going to be a war. I, I don't even want to call it a war. It would be more like a competition. It's a game of chess here. It's doing business. Who's going to do business the best? And if we're looking at things at face value, we would have to say the angiosperm in terms of the, the plant kingdom in, in comparison to the gymnosperm. If we're going to look at the human kingdom, the human kingdom is a bit different because, in my opinion, because I think that earlier homo, that homo spirit species, that earlier homo species, maybe close to a million years ago, um, that species... I think they might have had infinite intelligence, meaning that they had the forward thinking to understand and they set this scenario up because they probably paid attention in how uh, Earth was moving in terms of the alchemy of the planet. And it, all it takes just for anybody is to pay attention, pay attention to algorithms on how things work. Farmers and herbalists like yourself have done that, and this is how you're able to understand how certain planets speak. Plant, I said planets, but plants speak to you. And I think this is okay. really an important, important aspect when we're looking at domestication. And I think that many of the other homo species that did come about, some of them may have been wiped off because they might have been too aggressive. And any time you're domesticating a species, you need to get the right mixture so you can be able to domesticate them. That's why that first set, in my opinion, of homo sapien probably didn't have what it takes specifically. So what you do, you create another species, Homo sapiens sapiens. That one is a little bit more manageable. They can do your bidding, and they'll do it effectively without all of the hassles. And I think many of the stories, see, the, a lot of these things I'm talking about will fall in line with many of the stories when we, we hear about the Anunnaki coming here and they... And the start and, and their story of uh, they got they're getting mad at so-called upper management and all of these things. These things right here, these, these are all playgrounds. You know what I mean? We can see it throughout history. And having been been able to travel parts of the world to see some of these ancient structures, what I've noticed is that they found the square, and the the square was found. Because one of the more baffling things to me, Ma, I'll be honest with you, was how did they find the square? The square, mm -hmm. that square shape normally doesn't grow in nature, so we've been told. So if this is true, how did they find the square? They found the square. They found the square. Because they are part plant. Plants mm. emit the green color. Green, a specific aspect of green, the right angle, 
the right angle, 90 degree angle, is the color green. The aspect of green in which we are looking at will be close to, and everyone who has driven in the vehicle or has walked on their block and looked at the, uh, at the stoplight, when that light turns green, is that color spectrum is 90 degrees. But what makes it that color green? That color green is the mixture of both red and blue given it that color green, which are which, which, which what we call primary colors, to give us that secondary color of green, that coming together of two to create one, and that kind of green. And it was you only could be part of something to understand it. This is why it's easy for those who have inter- infinite intelligence or, 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 or have this Let me say ancient intelligence, not infinite intelligence, but ancient intelligence. Those who have this ancient intelligence understand this. You can come in and be friends with someone, a group of people that may not understand. They come in and they're able to absorb your culture, get everything you are, because they can utilize the same principles that have been done for billions of years right here on this planet and we've been manipulated by the plant. This is why everybody runs to try, oh, I want to try ayahuasca, or I want to try a mushroom. You want to get that intelligence. We still do it today. Mm -hmm. So before we look to those stars, be respectful. You heard me talk about respect of the heart. Be respectful to what's here on this planet. But I don't blame us, you know, for our disrespect. We have been domesticated this specific way to be disrespectful. This is what happened, to take advantage of certain attributes. And this is what's going on, in my opinion, today. And what I'll do is I'll stop here. Maybe someone wants to uh, come in because, you know me, I'll go on for four more hours easy talking about this stuff. But I think i got a lot of things in uh, in terms of that. But if you have any questions or if anybody's on the line that wants to chime in, um, I'll, I'll stop here, and then we can go ahead and, uh, you know, discuss. Oh, God, this was so wonderful. This was being in school, class 101. It was wonderful. We only have a few minutes to left, a very few minutes. And okay. I would love for you to share your information for those that may want to ask questions or have a discussion with God, give us your information. Absolutely, not a problem. If you want to reach me, uh, you can reach me at uh, mer meditation pyramids uh, dot com. That's mer m u r meditation pyramids. That's plural dot com, and um, you can reach me there. Or I do have a phone number for you. Um, give me a second here, and I'll punch that up because I don't call myself so. Uh, and your business and, line? Yeah, yeah, yes, the business line for people. Mm-hmm. So they can actually um, uh, reach out if they uh, are interested in uh, pyramids or you know, things to that nature. It's a uh, 973-718-4515. I'll repeat the number again, 973 one five. And we picked and your, your website address again too. Absolutely. I can be reached at Mer Meditation Pyramids dot com. And that's M U R Meditation Pyramids dot com. And if you want to reach me via email, you can reach me at Mer Meditation Pyramids at Gmail dot com. That's Mer Meditation Pyramids at Gmail dot com. For any questions uh, about what was mentioned here today, um, I'm hopeful that you know, what I, the information I shared, uh, people will you know digest it and uh, think about some of the things. Again, I, I want everyone to re- uh, at least have have this in mind. It, it, it's not about right or wrong, and I, I don't maybe because now I don't agree with so much of uh, the alien aspect. I'm more lean towards. Uh, nature being infinitely intelligent to do so, and uh, and the storylines that we've been told, 
uh, kind of coincide with that, at least from my perspective. But keep in mind, the alien aspect, I used to subscribe to that. So I was in that dimension of subscription for a while. I just kind of migrated into another dimension, which made more sense to me. So whatever your belief system is, it's not wrong. I think belief systems can, uh, to a great degree, can help people manage their way through their lives and still get the same results as someone who sees different from them. And I think that's the beauty uh, uh, of being able to have you, uh, be able to express yourself the way you see fit. It's not, I don't want to get anybody, you need to think this way. It's not about that, but it's about sharing dialogue, being able to, mm, to express each other's perspectives and being able to say, okay, well, I can see your point. I don't necessarily agree, but I can see your point and you make some sense. But, you know, I just ask people to do a little bit of research, look it up. Uh, so when you're th- thinking about uh, that kundalini energy, Think about the worm, the most intellectual, and think about function. You must think about function. Carnivore versus balancer. Carnivore versus balancer. And then you think, and then, then, then apply that sensibility to your lower lumbar region where the cooler is down there, your sacrum area, where you have to travel up through the lumbar and go up through the cervical area and, and thus forth, the thoracic area and the, and the, the cervical area it, 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 into the brain. Think about all that before anyone discounts the infinite intelligence of the worm and its power of domestication. God, I want to thank you so much. This is just so exciting and, like, overwhelming in a good way. I am so thankful that you're here and that you're sharing, and it's so much opening and food for thought. No thing greater than you, Siri. God is going to come again next month with more right. and new new information. This is just my baby country girl way, but just think about the caterpillar. The caterpillar goes into the cocoon and comes out a butterfly. And yeah. we just kind of overlook it, but... In a small way, it is the same analogy as all what you said. It's just that I put it in that way how my brain formulates. And so it is complete, 100% truth to it. Look at that, the caterpillar, which is part of, should we say, it's part of nature. And look at the formation that it changed into. Absolutely. That it, de- Absolutely. that it developed into, and it is so, I mean, we can look at, we can go on and on and on, and it's about to cut off, but in so many other aspects that we developed into, it, it's a scientific fact. It's awakening. Absolutely. It's, and, and Absolutely. it's worth to open and allow and to receive because it's truth. It's truth. Yeah, it's it's. It's really hard to deny when you're going against nature and you, you're being respectful, opening our minds to the respectful aspect of nature. One other thing I just wanted to mention to the family as well, too, when you, when you go to the website right now, um, as I said, I'm, I'm writing a book. The name of the book is called The Calendars Alive. It's a how to, uh, how to utilize the calendar to have success in your life. And that's the Mer calendar system. Um, it's not out yet, but what you can do is go to the website, enter your name and your and your email, and you'll be on the list. So once it's uh, once it's uh, out uh, for public consumption, then um, at that point you can be one of the first to have the book. It's called The Calendars Alive: A How-To on How to Utilize the Calendar to find success in your life, to you can manipulate the calendar's energy the way it is to, to find success in your life. So um, those principles are the same principles I laid out from nature, and I, utilize, I, I was able to see it in the calendar, so I, I implemented uh, it in there. So that's what that book is, would be basically about, it is about being able to manipulate it and utilize the calendar, as you've heard me talk about several times on this show. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. That is about the calendar. You can go into the archives and hear Garth talk about the calendar from last month. 
but that yeah. calendar can really awaken you, and it, it does have an impact on our life because we can see it from a different perspective and where we are. It's really mm-hmm. great having you. It has been so oh, wonderful. I'm always such a vibration, a high vibration, and awakening and bringing that light. And nature is our teacher. Nature is the one speaking. I don't think of it as just God, Avocat, Harvey's opinion, which he had to clarify that so you could open it. But it's nature. It's the laws. It's the laws of nature. And that's how we've been able to heal is confirming to the laws of nature, and that's what he's bringing forth and sharing with us to awaken from a different aspect. I thank you so much. With all the love in my heart, I love you, God, and all our family, all our dimensional family so very much. Thank you for being here and supporting us. What is the closing word you would like to say? There's no thing greater than you. This is not cliche line I'm saying. Once you actually see what this is all about, then you would first stand that I truly mean what I say. There is no thing greater than you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. With all good my night. heart, good night. With love night. in my heart. Enjoy the love of life. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Good night. Okay. Bye. Mm-hmm.